Hey everybody, I hope you guys are all doing safe. So this is the 2021 iPad Pro. So for those of you guys who follow tech news, you should know that this iPad is a little bit of a big deal because there are two really big upgrades to this iPad. So the first is that this screen right here, 12.9 inch panel, now uses mini LED technology. Now mini LED is basically the next evolution of the LCD display technology, it differs from OLED panels. They're two different tech. But basically how LCD panels work is that underneath the glass display panel, there are a bunch of LED lights that light up the screen. On a traditional LCD panel, like a iPad Air 2020 that I have here, Apple says that there are 72 LED lights underneath this panel, 72. On the iPad Pro 2021, Apple says there are over 10,000, 10,000 LED lights underneath because they're much smaller, mini LED, so Apple could cram more of them underneath. So what's the benefit of having more LED lights underneath the panel? That gives Apple more range of control because there's more different panels they can manipulate to make one brighter, make one not as bright. So that means the iPad Pro 2021 with this mini LED panel gets noticeably brighter than any other iPad before, any other tablet I've ever used, including the Samsung Galaxy Tab S7, and any other laptop I've ever tested, including my 2019 MacBook, which is pretty specced out. On top of that, Mini LED also brings a higher level of contrast than previous LCD panels can do. So if you look at the black right here in the corner, it is pretty deep. Maybe not as deep black as an OLED panel's black, but this is definitely much better than how this image would look on a MacBook or an older iPad. This is just almost like OLED level of contrast because Mini LED has a greater range. To be honest, just showing you the screen here doesn't really do it justice. You have to go to an Apple store and just look at it yourself. Within five seconds of playing around, you should be able to see that the screen gets noticeably brighter, it's more vivid, and animations are just more smooth than most other tablets and laptops that you are used to. This is particularly noticeable for me when I'm using the iPad Pro in bed. This is when I like to do a lot of reading. Maybe I read words and also comic books. When I'm cycling through the pages, it really feels like it's a little bit more personal than looking on a computer screen because I'm actually putting my fingers and swiping through the page and I can see the animations of the page turning. And this iPad Pro has probably the best speakers I've ever heard in any tablet. It's a quad speaker system. Okay, now let's talk about the M1 chip and why it is so important. Now, for those of you who already know all about the M1 and why it's such a groundbreaking chip, you can jump ahead a minute or two. This is for people who may not follow computer news. So basically, the M1 chip, it's like a smartphone chip, like the same chip that Apple uses in the iPhone, the A series, or like a Qualcomm Snapdragon. This is a small silicon, maybe like the size, like this big. And in that small chip, it contains all the required computing bits, including the CPU, whatever is needed to run the graphics, the modem, all that. Now the benefit of having this mobile chip set up on ARM architecture is that everything has greater synergy because they're connected, because they're on one chip, they're on the same architecture. They're all speaking to each other continuously. This makes for better energy efficiency and also just kind of everything moves a little bit faster. That explains why when you launch apps on a smartphone, it launches immediately. Now for over a decade, the computing industry kind of accepted that these type of mobile chips, they are ideal for smartphones and tablets, but not for computers because for computers still needs like greater processing power. You need a proper CPU, just one chip that's just the brain and a se separate chip just to handle graphics, stuff like that. That is why for 10 years, computers almost exclusively use proper CPUs, usually from Intel, while smartphones and tablets use these smaller silicon. And for a decade, Apple followed that plan too. That's why on its iPhones and tablets would use Apple's A series, a mobile chip, while Apple's MacBooks would use Intel Core CPUs until last year. That's when Apple decided, you know what? We've developed a mobile chip that is powerful enough for a laptop. We no longer need Intel's CPUs. And starting last November, Apple released a MacBook Air and a Mac Mini that is powered by the M1 chip. Now remember, like I said, for 10 years, 
it was accepted that a mobile chip is not powerful enough for a computer. So people went into reviewing the MacBook Air with a little bit of skepticism. They weren't sure what to expect. So it actually blew everyone's mind when the M1 powered MacBook Air actually outperformed the Intel power MacBooks. And so when Apple announced that it was putting the M1 chip in the iPad, it, it's huge news because this is, the processor in here is basically more powerful than most Intel Core i9 computers out on the market right now. And I put this to a test and it's true. So basically first I did a benchmark test on Geekbench 5 and the multi-core score of the M1 iPad Pro beat the Snapdragon 888 score, beat the score in this iPad Air, which runs on Apple's A14. So this iPad Air runs on the same chip in the iPhone 12 right now and then lost to the M1. And the M1 also beat my 2019 Intel Core i9 MacBook Pro with 32 gigs of RAM. It cost me 3,200 US dollar to purchase. That's a benchmark test. And then in the real world test, what I did is I edited together a 4K 30 video that lasted 26 minutes and 38 seconds. I put them on iMovie on all three devices, the MacBook Pro, the M1 iPad Pro, and the 2020 iPad Air. And I hit render on all three and started a timer. So the M1 iPad Pro finished rendering the footage first in 13 minutes and five seconds. This iPad Air came in second place at 15 minutes and four seconds. The 2019 iMac took 30 minutes, 18 seconds. So it took more than twice as long to render the exact same 4K footage. So we know that the M1 chip is super, super powerful even for a freaking MacBook. So for the iPad Pro, it's a little bit of an overkill, right? Because most of you guys probably really know this. The iPad Pro runs iPad OS, which is really just a modified version of iOS on iPhones. And iOS, to Apple's credit, is very well optimized to be efficient. So even if you have a relatively old iPhone, like an iPhone 8, which is four years old now, everything's still gonna load perfectly fine on an iPhone 8. You know, if you're launching Instagram, you're launching Slack, Facebook, Twitter, it's not gonna lag on you just because it's a four year old iPhone because iOS is super efficient. So the fact that this is basically iOS, then why do we need the M1 chip? Even if you use like an older four year old Apple chip on this, iPad OS is still gonna run really smoothly. The only difference, like I said, is if you really push it in a benchmarking app and also if you're rendering a 4K video and I'm willing to bet most people out in the world do not need to render 4K videos regularly. So my point is that even though this iPad performs flawlessly, it is as powerful as anything out in the world right now, it is a little bit overkill. It has too much power for what this machine can do. But this is where it gets interesting because there are rumors in the computing industry that Apple has big plans for this iPad Pro, that maybe Apple's doing something more. The rumors come from not just the fact that this is M1, but because Apple randomly decided to put 16 gigs of RAM into this machine. This is a huge jump from last year's iPad Pro, which maxed out at six gigs of RAM. And if you know Apple at all, you know that they generally, they don't care about RAM at all for the mobile devices. Even the newest iPhone, I believe only has six gigs of RAM and any older iPhone just has like three or four gigs. Apple's never cared about RAM on its mobile devices because Apple knows its system is so efficient. So the fact that this machine suddenly has 16 gigs of RAM is a little bit curious, right? It feels like Apple is future-proofing the devices for something that's to come. So maybe Apple is gonna introduce better multitasking. Maybe you can finally open apps in a floating window that can be resized. Maybe you can actually split the screen into four and run four different apps. There's even a rumor that Apple may bring over Mac OS apps over to the iPad, including Final Cut Pro. Ultimately, that's just rumors. As it is right now, I find iPad OS to be slightly limiting for my day-to-day -day work. And the M1 chip and 16 gigs of RAM is overkill on this software. You can run this software using like an iPhone 8 chip and it will be fine. Now there's one more new feature to the iPad Pro. That is the front facing camera is now an ultra wide angle camera. And when you're in a FaceTime call or a Zoom call, the ultra wide angle camera will work with the M1 chip to track your face. So that means you can move around, you know, while you're talking 
and the camera will try to keep you center frame. And it works quite well actually. And if a second person steps in the frame, then the camera will take that person into account and keep both of us in frame two. Now back here, you have a triple camera system. Two of these are 12 megapixel sensors, the typical wide and ultra wide focal length. They work fine, nothing amazing. But right here, this is a LiDAR scanner. Now this is not new, this was in the last two I've had pros to. But LiDAR is basically like radar, it's like a depth sensor and it does a really good job of scanning your environment so you can run AR apps. And because Apple has put so much attention into augmented reality and because Apple users generally spend much more money on apps than Android users and Windows users, so that means augmented reality app makers are more willing to make apps for iOS and iPad OS too. So you have some really interesting apps on the iPad Pro for educational or fun purposes. Like for example, Angry Bird, you can actually set up like an obstacle in the middle of a living room and just play. And it really detects your environment very nicely. The other thing I really like to use is the measure app. You can actually measure accurately how tall your ceiling is, how wide your cabinet is. And like I said, because the LiDAR scanner is so good at detecting your surface and the actual depth, the measurements are quite accurate, way more accurate than using the same type of app on an Android phone. So ultimately, the iPad Pro is an excellent machine for play because whatever you can do on an iPhone, you can do on this. Everything just looks a little bit better, a little bit bigger. Playing games on this obviously is amazing with a larger screen and uh, better speakers. Now as for whether or not you can use the iPad Pro for work, that depends on your usage. I can't quite use it because I need Final Cut Pro and I need more than two apps at the same time. But not everyone needs to use these things like I do. For some people, maybe a journalist, they only need to write articles. You know, I used to be a newspaper writer. So if you go back to that time, I can definitely use the iPad Pro as this. I only need two apps at most anyway. Or if you're a student, most of the time you're just writing papers, reading textbooks, then the iPad Pro will probably get the job done for you too. So if you're someone that can use the iPad Pro for work, this is a damn good purchase because you're getting a machine for both work and play and it's gonna excel at both very well too. For me personally, I'm still waiting for the rumors to come true. I'm waiting for Apple to add more capabilities to the software, bring more Mac OS apps over to take advantage of the fact that this has 16 gigs of RAM and the best damn processor in the computer space right now. So this model, the iPad Pro, the 12.9 inch model starts at 1,100 US dollars. But at this price, you're only getting 128 gigs of storage. Now, if you use iCloud or other cloud services, then you should be fine, 128 gigs may be okay. But it's gonna be a little bit cramped tight for most people. So I would suggest jumping up to the 256 gigs model, which adds another like $250 to 1,300, $1,400. Unfortunately, that's just for the tablet. You have to buy accessories because you don't want to buy an M1 iPad just to use it as a tablet. You definitely got to use, use it as a computer too. So if you don't want to pay for this Magic Keyboard, which it's excellent, but quite expensive, I believe it's like 250 US dollars or something, you can buy a third party keyboard. That's a benefit of using Apple products because Apple is such a huge brand that there is like dozens, if not hundreds of accessories third-party accessories out there. So you can definitely pick up a third-party iPad keyboard that will work with this machine just fine. Probably find it for under 100 bucks maybe. This just brings much more versatility than a traditional laptop. Now, of course, I'm not saying there's no use for a laptop. I still need it for Final Cut Pro, but like I said, if Apple ever puts Final Cut Pro on this, then my laptop might be able to be retired. So anyway, that's about it for this video. This is the iPad Pro. 2021. One more thing I want to mention, the mini LED screen, that new technology, it's only on this larger 12.9 inch iPad Pro. So if you buy the 11 inch iPad Pro, you don't get the screen. You just get a more traditional LCD panel, kind of like this iPad Air. This is still a fine screen. It's not the best screen around, but you know, I would say if you're buying the new 2021 iPad Pro, you might want to consider getting the larger 12.9 inch model. So anyway, that's it. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel or follow me on Instagram at Ben's Gadget Reviews. Thanks for watching.